for a thousand years, kings and queens of Europe had absolute power. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Greed, revenge, sex, madness, witchcraft, murder. Every monarch had their royal secrets. Everyone envied the power of monarchs and would go to any lengths to gain it. And when occasional accidents of history provided an opening, crafty commoners tried to claim that power. Their attempts always ended in disaster. Danish King Johann Struensee, Russian Tsar Dmitri, and English Prince Perkin Warbeck tried to become kings. They have left no echo in history because they were impostors. These mute walls at the Tower of London hold the secret to the most baffling mystery in British history, a case that remains unsolved after 500 years. These boys, Prince Richard, nine, and his brother, Prince Edward, aged 12, are at the heart of the mystery. On June 26th, 1483, the bewildered boys, grieving the death of their father less than three months before, were ushered into the tower. As the doors slammed shut behind them, they moved out of history and into legend. The boy's uncle, Richard, had been entrusted as their guardian, but Richard himself wanted to be king. Within three months, he declared his royal nephews illegitimate and locked them in the tower. He then took the throne for himself as Richard III. The two princes were never seen again, and to this day, no one really knows what happened to them. Two years later, Richard III was killed in battle by the man who became Henry VII. King Henry knew the princes had disappeared, so it was a shock when, six years later, a young man appeared in Ireland and declared he was one of the missing boys in the tower, Prince Richard. Could it be one of the boys had somehow escaped? The reappearance of the rightful heir to the English throne was a challenge to the unpopular King Henry VII. The newly resurfaced Richard traveled through Europe, lobbying to reclaim the throne. He found support among King Henry's enemies in England and abroad. The enemies were glad to regard Richard as the lost prince and join his campaign to overthrow Henry's dynasty. He met the lost prince's aunt, who bolstered the young man's credibility by declaring he was indeed her long-lost nephew. In the summer of 1497, the young man who claimed to be a prince and 6,000 men landed in England to claim the crown. But King Henry was ready for them. Richard's ill-prepared rebel army was confronted by Henry's formidable fighting machine. Faced with overwhelming odds, Richard's nerve broke and his army fled in disarray. The young claimant was quickly captured. Unmasked, as an imposter, scared and alone, the pretender wrote to his mother. My mother, fate has dealt me such a hand that I find myself in the power of the King of England. I beg you to send me some money that I may receive kinder treatment from my captors. The money failed to help, and after some persuasion by his guards, the young man told the true story of how Henry's enemies had coached him to masquerade as the lost prince. First, let it be known that I was born in the town of Tournai in Flanders, and my name is Perkin Warbeck. And they made me to learn English and taught me what I should do and say. And after this, they called me Duke of York. And thence I went into France into Ireland, and from Ireland into Scotland, and so into England. 
After Warbeck admitted he was an imposter, King Henry wanted to minimize this threat to his authority and treated him lightly. The imposter was pardoned and employed as a courtier, traveling everywhere with the king so he could be carefully watched. But it was not long before Warbeck tried to escape. He was quickly recaptured and the king decided to keep a closer eye on the erratic imposter. Warbeck was locked up in the Tower of London, just like the real prince he had pretended to be. This time, Warbeck was not treated well by his captors and tried to escape again. The king finally lost his patience with the imposter and hanged Warbeck in 1499. No one else ever came forward again to claim he was one of the surviving boy princes. What happened to the real princes remained a mystery. Then, in 1674, a builder made a horrific discovery beneath a stairwell in the Tower of London, the crushed bones of two young boys. It appeared the princes were indeed murdered in the tower. But 500 years later, who killed them remains a controversy. In Russia, the tragedy of another child also created an identity crisis and fueled a claim to the throne. But this time, a bloodbath resulted and a kingdom almost fell. The chain of events began with the death of Tsar Ivan the Terrible, as these icons portray. He left two sons, and the first in line, the sickly Feodor, became Tsar. But there was also a younger boy, Dmitri, Ivan's son by his seventh wife. Though this marriage was not officially recognized by the Orthodox Church, Dmitri's mother and her family plotted to get Dmitri on the throne. Tsar Feodor's hated chief minister, the ambitious Boris Godunov, wanted to hold on to power and banish Dmitri and his family to a remote Russian town. There, they were watched by Godunov's church informers. Years went by, and little Dmitri grew up, epileptic but otherwise healthy. Meanwhile, in Moscow, his half-brother, Feodor, became increasingly sickly. The scheming Boris Godunov began to worry Dmitri could become Tsar. In the summer of 1591, a mysterious incident involving Dmitri occurred in an orchard where a group of children were playing with a knife. As the children chased each other amongst the trees, a boy fell to the ground blood pouring from his throat. The child was dead. Details were murky and the situation confused. Pealing church bells and news of the child's death caused a panic. The cry went up through the town that young Dmitri, next in line to be Tsar, had been murdered, and Boris Godunov's involvement was widely suspected. Townspeople arrived on the scene looking for the assassin. All the children playing in the orchard were hunted down, beaten to death with clubs, and burned with torches. By nightfall, the crowd hysteria led to an orgy of vigilante killings. Some were tortured to extract confessions. Inflamed by vodka, the mob cornered the Tsar's envoy. He was beaten to the ground and hacked to pieces with axes. The brutal, mindless bloodbath left 12 innocent people dead. In the mayhem, Dmitri's body was trampled and mutilated so badly his mother couldn't possibly identify her own son. 
Boris Godunov's self-serving official verdict was that Dmitri accidentally cut his own throat while having an epileptic fit. Godunov now stood to become Tsar in the event of sickly Fyodor's death. Twelve years passed, and then a mysterious Russian monk arrived in a remote borderland between Russia and Poland. When the monk became the personal valet to a Polish prince, a chronicler recorded a startling revelation. The prince got very angry and fetched him a slap on the face, calling him a son of a whore, at which the valet began to weep bitterly and said to the prince, If you, Prince Adam, knew who I am, you would not rail at me for being a whore's son, much less box my ears for such a trifle. But since I profess to be a servant, I must bear it with patience. Well, who are you then, and what is your name? I am Dmitri, lost son of Tsar Ivan of Russia, my lord. Dmitri explained that years before, Gudunov had plotted to kill him, and that another child, substituted by his family, had died in the massacre. Since then, Dmitri lived, disguised as a monk, waiting for the right moment to reveal his true identity. The Catholic Prince Adam hated his Russian neighbors and was only too glad to believe Dmitri. Meanwhile, in Moscow, Boris Godunov had taken over as Tsar after the sickly Feodor finally died. Russia was a society abounding in rumor, and the unpopular Godunov's enemies tried to weaken his power by promoting stories Dmitri was still alive and in hiding. When news of Dmitri's appearance in Poland reached the capital, Gudunov was stunned and his enemies jubilant. Dmitri spoke perfect aristocratic Russian, was well-educated, a superb horseman. He had the same regal bearing as his presumed father, Ivan, and his fine white hands were more like a king's than a monk's. For the Poles, it proved he was heir to the Russian throne. Gudunov's enemies overlooked the fact Dmitri was a Catholic, not Russian Orthodox. Poles and Cossacks joined forces to support Dmitri's cause. They formed a cavalry force to ride on Moscow and install Dmitri as their figurehead. Winning against Tsar Gudunov's army, by 1604 the cavalry was outside the gates of Moscow. A contemporary account described the Polish cavalry. They strutted and boasted these ferocious young embodiments of Mars. They cracked nuts with their eyes and killed flies with their pointed moustaches. They hated flowers because they did not explode or smell like gunpowder. As luck would have it, the hated Boris Godunov died just as Dmitri's army was approaching. The invading Poles and Cossacks were received as liberators by Moscow's population. Dmitri's mother came out of her convent seclusion and embraced the man she believed was her long-lost son. But Dmitri's moment of glory was short-lived. Dmitri lauded it over a decadent, debauched and drunken court, and he put the Poles who brought him to Moscow in positions of power. Russians began to resent the invaders and their figurehead, Dmitri. They finally lost their patience when the new Tsar married a Polish Catholic princess in a Russian Orthodox church, a great sacrilege. Panicky rumors now spread that Dmitri was a traitor and an imposter. Late one night, Russians locked the gates of Moscow. Alarm bells sounded, and a massacre of the Polish nobles began. Dmitri was stabbed to death. His corpse left in Red Square for three days for the public to hack, kick, and abuse. A bonfire was set and his remains were burned. Then his ashes were dumped into a cannon and fired in the direction of Poland, from whence he had come.
Unlike Russia under Boris Godunov, Denmark in 1770 was a stable kingdom until a usurper who wanted to seize power appeared at the royal court. Christian VII was a mentally unbalanced drunk with a fondness for flagellation. This, added to his epilepsy, rendered the king incapable of ruling. Historians later observed that by the time he had become king, he was a degraded and ludicrous exhibitionist, hopelessly self-indulgent and incapable of any but the most trivial of relationships. Christian VII married German princess Caroline Matilda, a 15-year-old who still played with dolls. Their three-day honeymoon must have been unsatisfying since Christian soon started to visit the brothels of Copenhagen. On the rare occasions when the king visited his wife's bed, he made her dress in military uniform. Despite their erratic sex life, Caroline soon gave birth to a son. Caroline remained unhappy and lonely until a dashing young German doctor, Johann Friedrich Struense, joined the royal household as the ailing king's personal physician, specializing in the treatment of mental diseases. The enigmatic Prussian was considered an eccentric because he kept a human skeleton candelabra at his bedside, and he was unable to speak Danish. But Dr. Struense did manage to ingratiate himself into the royal household by successfully inoculating the young crown prince against smallpox, a practice both revolutionary and potentially fatal at the time. Queen Caroline was very grateful. The young, lonesome queen soon fell into the arms of a handsome doctor. But it wouldn't be long before their affair became painfully public. Struense continued to treat King Christian for his bizarre collection of ailments, but the monarch became yet more unstable, often indulging in flagellation and threatening suicide. The king had heard voices in his head since childhood, and Struense offered him a radical new therapy, shock treatment. When even this failed, the good doctor used sedatives, which rendered his mistress's husband conveniently semi-conscious for long periods of time. But an affair with the queen was not enough for the ambitious doctor. He wanted real power he managed to get the king to appoint him cabinet secretary, then a count. Soon, Struense manipulated the king to sign over his absolute power, and the German doctor now ran the Danish kingdom. Struense implemented a series of reforms, some of which are still in use today. The laws freed peasants from oppression, abolished torture, and created freedom of religion. He founded the first clinic for sexually transmitted diseases and, not surprisingly, abolished punishment for adulterers. In all, the interloper passed over 1,000 pieces of legislation. Despite his reforms, the changes earned him powerful enemies. Commoners resented his increasingly blatant affair with their queen. The nobility hated him for taking away their power over the lower classes, and everyone hated him for being foreign. As their affair continued to flower, the foreign doctor and his lover, Queen Caroline, grew bolder and more indiscreet, meeting for amorous trysts here in the king's private bathroom. For a time, they were very happy. And then Caroline gave birth to a daughter who bore an uncanny resemblance to the doctor. Their affair became a public scandal. Pornographic paintings of the queen and the doctor could be bought from vendors in the back streets of Copenhagen.
This scandal and the loved child's birth were the final straw for the king's stepmother, Juliana Marie, who was worried about her own position at court. Palace staff were instructed to plug keyholes with pellets of wax and dust corridors with powder in an attempt to collect enough evidence to prove the adulterous relationship. Juliana Marie was outraged when confronted with the indisputable evidence of missing wax pellets from keyholes and with the ghostly footprints in the powder, proof that the increasingly powerful Dr. Struense was making regular nocturnal visits to the Queen's bedchamber. The New Year's Eve masked ball of 1772 proved to be the lovers' last public appearance together. Juliana Marie staged a palace coup, forcing her mentally incapable stepson, King Christian, to sign the arrest warrant. Struense was dragged from his bed, charged with treason, and imprisoned in Copenhagen's strongest military stronghold. The government quickly annulled King Christian's marriage to Caroline, and she was thrown in prison. Never to see her children again, Caroline was exiled to her native Germany, where she died of smallpox three years later. With Dr. Struense under arrest, the public gave vent to its outrage. The satirical and obscene cartoons of the ill-starred lovers were now freely published. Prior to his trial, Struense was kept for three months in solitary confinement, here, in this cell in Copenhagen's citadel. The energy he once used to create new laws was put to good use as he prepared his own defense. The incriminating evidence gathered by palace spies, the ghostly nocturnal footprints, the stained bedsheets, and a pair of pink silk garters the doctor bought for the queen weighed heavily against him. In April 1772, a commission of inquiry found Struense guilty of usurping the king's power and of adultery with the king's wife. Despite Denmark's reputation as a liberal country, Struense was sentenced to a particularly brutal death. Having himself outlawed torture, Struense then fell victim to its horrors. The doctor's right hand, the hand used to sign royal decrees, was chopped off. He was then beheaded, his body quartered and broken on the wheel. Johann Struense's remains were jammed on spikes in the grounds of Frederiksberg Castle, the home of the king's stepmother. Every day she could look out of her window to watch birds pick clean the bones of Denmark's infamous usurper until no trace of the good Dr. Struense remained. Danish King Johann Struense, Russian Tsar Dmitri, and English Prince Perkin Warbeck all paid a hideous price for their impertinence. With no real power, imposters always failed to usurp monarchs. They just faded away to become mere footnotes in history. <laughs> 